So we're in the book of Matthew, and we're in chapter 4, and we're looking at Jesus' temptation in the desert by Satan. The context here is Herod was trying to kill all the newborn babies in Bethlehem. The family of Jesus fled to Egypt. Herod died, and so now it's safe for them to come back. And they go back to Mary's hometown of Nazareth. And last week, we took a big lump, jump forward. Jesus isn't a baby anymore. He's in his 30s. And uh, his cousin, John the Baptist, is out there fulfilling this prophetic role of preparing the way for the Messiah. And we spent a lot of time talking about that two weeks ago. Chapter 3 ends, we didn't really cover this, and it is significant. It ends with Jesus being baptized by John. It says in verse 13 that Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan River, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tries to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Imagine that. You're you know, a preacher, a prophet, and here comes Jesus, and he's like, would you baptize me? You'd be like, no, no, you can baptize me. And Jesus says, no, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John baptized him. So remember what we talked about with baptism. The imagery of baptism was, was repentance and was washing sin away, symbolically. And they have this exchange, and John's like, you don't need your sins cleansed, least of all by me. And Jesus is like, that's true. I don't need to, I, am, I have not sinned, but this is the way we're going to do it. And John's like, you're the, you're the God, I'm the creation, let's do this. So then we get to chapter 4. Jesus is baptized. God uh, says, this is my servant in whom I'm well, well pleased and before Jesus actually goes out and begins doing his ministry, remember at this point, Jesus has been raised by Joseph and Mary. He's become a carpenter in the family business and the family trade, but he hasn't been going to synagogues and doing teachings and all these things. In the Jewish uh, culture, you had to be 30 before you could be a rabbi. And so Jesus is just sort of coming of age for uh, being able to do ministry. He's just turned 30 and he's just been baptized and God leads him out into the desert by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, this raises a whole host of interesting things. The devil, the tempter, you know, this character has different names. The devil, Lucifer, Satan. And there's all this baggage culturally that comes along with this idea of who this person is, what they look like. Uh, and there's a lot of these ridiculous sort of uh, renditions of, who this being is. It comes from a lot of medieval imagery. What it doesn't come from is the Bible. The whole red guy, horns, hooves, uh, pitchfork, all of that comes from human imagination, not from the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about who this is, but it's important that we differentiate sort of pop culture and whatever shoes little Nas is selling right now and look at what does the Bible actually say so that we can have a clear perspective and picture of what we're talking about. This character is called Satan. In the Hebrew, that's pronounced Satan. This is actually one of the words that we take just from Hebrew and just use it the way that, that they use it. What's interesting is it's a verb. That's, it's most often used as a verb. Uh, the theological work, word book of the Old Testament says the verb Satan occurs six times in the Old Testament, often in participle forms for one who bears a grudge and cherishes animosity. So if I want to attack you and accuse you of something terrible, I would Satan you. And that's primarily the way that Hebrew word is used. 
Interestingly, it is sometimes used as a noun. And in the Old Testament book of Zechariah 3, it's used both as a noun and as a verb. It says, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing there at his right hand to Satan him, is what that actually says in the Hebrew. So here it's Satan is a person who's occupying spying space, who's actually doing something. And what they're doing is Sataning them. So it means to accuse, to attack, to stand against but it also is referring to a personal being. There is actually a being, according to the Bible, who occupies the role of Satan and does a lot of Sataning. He's known as the accuser of the brethren. And this is something that could be hard for us to grasp because it's creepy and it's weird and we're like, mm. but let's just think about this rationally for a moment. If you believe there's a God, okay, and that God is a personal being, meaning God has thoughts, God has feelings, God has a will, then what you're saying is, is there's a being, there's such a thing as a spiritual being that doesn't have a body like we do, that exists and operates in space and time, okay? And so if you're opening the door for the supernatural, that there is such a thing as a God, or a supernatural being. And if you're willing to accept that there are angels, which are also spiritual beings that have minds and personalities, names and free wills, then angels are personal. God is personal. We are personal. And what part of being personal means from a biblical perspective is having the ability to choose, having free will. We can rebel against God or we can be loyal to God. We can choose to say to the all-powerful creator God of the universe, no. That's something we can do. That's what free will is. And according to the Bible, angels are also free will beings. They're spiritual beings. We're, we're this weird, we're actually the weird ones. We're a mutt because we have bodies like animals and spirits like angels. We're this weird, in the, uh, the creation history and the narrative of everything that God has made, we're this weird confluence of physical and spiritual at the same time. The angels are spiritual. And according to the Bible, the individual referred to as Satan or the devil or Lucifer was an angel who used their free will to rebel against God, similarly to the way we have as a race. And that is who Satan is. Satan is an angel that rebelled against God before the creation of the earth. You can read about that in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. According to the Bible, this personal being that was an angel who rebelled against God was also the serpent who tempted Eve. You can read about that in Genesis 3 and the explanation of why it's Satan in Revelations 12 and Revelations 20. This being hates God, hates man, and his goal is to deceive people. The idea here is that this was a wonderful, amazing, beautiful, brilliant, powerful angel that decided he was so great, what do we need God for? Decided to rebel against God and was convincing enough that a third of the angels in heaven thought that was a good idea. And he stands against who God is. His argument is essentially, God is not worthy of our worship. So we should join him in rebelling against who God is. John 8, 44, Jesus describes this person. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. That is a lot of vitriolic 
You don't usually see Jesus put a smackdown on somebody like that. In this case, he's talking to the Pharisees who were the only other people he did smack down. And he's like, you guys and Satan, very similar. <laughs> I see a lot of, of uh, the Venn diagram between you is quite large. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 11, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. You see what's happening there? Like if Satan were to appear before you, he wouldn't show up as some kind of grotesque monster with horns and cleft feet. He would show up and you would be tempted to worship him. You would, be, you would think that well, before you was a good and glorious, benevolent being that's come to bless you. That's how Satan masquerades. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to the deeds. People who follow Satan typically aren't in satanic cults wearing goat leggings and drawing pentagrams on the ground. They're running churches. They're pretending and teaching a false doctrine. They're teaching something other than the grace of God. And they themselves are convinced that what they're teaching is right. They would look like very good people. And I'm not talking about anything weird like everybody that's not in this church. No, there are all kinds of awesome churches out there, okay? But there are also churches out there that know nothing of the Bible and the Word of God and know nothing about Jesus Christ crucified. And they are teaching a false doctrine and unwittingly have been deceived because that's what Satan does into teaching people, for instance, that you can earn God's love or that you can be forgiven by God by giving your money away, or that you can be forgiven by God by being a good person. These are things that the Bible very clearly denounces as untrue, yet there's a lot of people who think that they're Christians, who talk about Christianity, and think that's exactly what the Bible says. They're deceived. The Bible says that Satan is the ruler of this world. That's disconcerting. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. But the whole world, the, in the Bible, there's this thing called the world system. It's called the cosmos in the Greek. And it basically says the whole world system is set up to confuse us and to lead us away from God. It's telling us things like, uh, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's telling us things like, you have to love yourself before you can love other people. It's telling us things like, there are many paths to God. It's telling us things like, money can make you happy. And that it's worth sacrificing relationships in order to have power. That's the world system. I don't need to spend a lot of time describing it to you guys because you face it every day. You live in it. You experience the pressure to be selfish. It's in you and me. And the Bible says this is a, this is a diabolical plan of God's enemy to distract us from the things that, that really matter, namely love, relationships, and God. And so this system is at work to oppress, to fool, to deceive, and Satan uses temptation to draw us away from closeness to God. If you want to do a little experiment, do a little scientific experiment, sit down when you go home tonight and try to pray for 10 minutes, and you will find all kinds of temptation to oh, I got to check the weather tomorrow. Oh, my favorite show's coming on. Oh, this person I haven't talked to in 10 years just called me. That's the world system reacting to you trying to do something good. It happens all the time. We're so enmeshed in it that we forget that it's there. We're like fish in water when it comes to 
the world system and its power to try to drive us away from the things that God says really matter. So Jesus' temptation is, he's been in the desert for 40 days. So he's really, really hungry and really, really thirsty. He's dehydrated. He's starving. And Satan shows up, the tempter, and says, listen, if you really are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Which I think is a pretty bizarre temptation. Why, why is this important? How is this tempting? And what would be so bad if Jesus is the son of God? What would be so bad if he turned stones into bread? He'd clearly be capable of doing that. I think it actually raises many important questions about the dynamics of who Jesus is and how the Bible portrays him. How about this? If Jesus is God, how can he be tempted? If God is perfectly good, perfectly just, perfectly righteous and all powerful and knows all things, how can he be like, mm, maybe Satan's right? How does that work? How about this? Why would Satan tempt Jesus if he hates him so much? Why not just kill him? Why not just show up and be like, I can't believe you took human form and became in my reach and bah, murder him. Or why is turning stones into bread tempting? Those are some things we should think about for a few minutes. If Jesus is God, how can God be tempted? Well, it's important to understand what the Bible says about Jesus. It says that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Jesus is God, that through Jesus, the entire universe was created, and that he was born in 0 AD. He took on flesh. He pre-existed his enfleshment. This is something theologians call the incarnation. Carne, carne is meat. The incarnation is the, meat, the meatness of God. God becoming meaty is the incarnation. And so there was, Jesus has always existed, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus took on flesh and he could be killed, but he could also be tempted. Meaning that when he took on flesh, he felt things like hunger. He had to go to the bathroom. He could become thirsty. He could become depressed. He could be sad. He could be weak. You can't do any of those things if you don't have a body. And by taking those things on, Jesus limited himself. You can be all powerful, but you, part of your prerogative in being all powerful is you can limit your power. And Jesus limited himself. When he took on a body, he was no longer everywhere. He was somewhere in a body. And this opened him up to this experience of temptation because he was experiencing all the physical hardships and desires that we experience. Some people don't like to think of Jesus that way, but they need to read their Bibles. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. It's not saying that Jesus sinned. That's the fully God part that kept him from doing that. But it's saying he gets it. When you are like, I'm so tempted, God. I'm so tempted to lose my temper. I'm so tempted to have an affair. I'm so tempted to steal from work. God's like, I get it. I, was, I had a body. I understand how that feels. It sucks. Very painful, very difficult. God is sympathetic to the trials that we go through because he himself experienced them. Why would Satan tempt Jesus? Why not just kill him? Well, he'd get around to killing him, but he wanted to play with him first. 
It says in John 13, 2, that Satan put it on the heart of Judas to betray Christ. Satan was actively involved in the betrayal and the murder of Jesus Christ. But before you kill him, why not discredit him? You know, it's difficult to speculate on how Satan would process this, but maybe he was thinking something like, well, if God took on a human nature, maybe that makes him vulnerable enough where I can get him on my side. These humans certainly have gotten on my side. And maybe I can convince the son to join me in my rebellion against God. See, Satan doesn't need Jesus to swear allegiance to him. All he needs Jesus to do is disobey God. If he can get Jesus to disobey God, then Jesus is no longer sinless. And he's no longer able to die for the sins of the world. And he's no longer in God's camp and God himself will have to judge him. So he tries to match wits with Jesus. Why is turning stones into bread tempting? Well, Jesus was supposed to depend on the Father and not use his own divine nature. When we get real technical about the incarnation, what we say is, Jesus didn't give up his divine attributes. He declined to use his divine attributes. He was still all powerful. He could still do whatever he wanted, but he wanted to experience the entire human condition. So he obeyed the father and the father did amazing miracles through him, but Jesus did not use his own power to do that. And you might think I'm crazy, but read John 5:19. Therefore, Jesus answered, saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. So to have the full gambit of human experience, Jesus is not going to use his divine attributes. God would use his the Father would use the power of God to do what needs to be done in the right time, and he would do it through Jesus. If Jesus uses it himself, he breaks the rules. Now, he's starving 40 days in the desert, and Satan shows up and reminds him, you could just turn those stones into bread. He's got all the hunger that we have low blood sugar, dry mouth, he's hangry, he's dying. And Satan is quick to remind him, you know, at any second, you could have bread. And Jesus looks at him and answers in verse 4. He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. You see what Satan just did there? It's so brilliant. Satan said, turn these breads into stone or stone into bread. And Jesus is like, it is written, you shall not live on bread alone. He quotes scripture. And then Satan says, throw yourself off this and let the angels pick you up. Because it is written, now Satan is quoting scripture to Jesus. Diabolical. It is written, he'll command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it's also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, Satan is the ruler of this world. And he shows them the glory of the world system. And he says, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. So let's talk about the dynamics of temptation here. Jesus was hungry and he could use his power in a way that was against the plan to feed himself. Jesus wanted to reveal himself to the world, and what a great, powerful way. Jesus jumps off the temple, and before he strikes the ground, angels pick him up. Everybody would be like, I believe we found the Messiah. 
What a great entrance to make. But Jesus says, I can't do that because it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And then Satan's like, listen, you came to save the human world, the human race, and you want to rule the world and you want to set up your kingdom here. You know, that's my kingdom, but I'll give it to you. You don't have to go and die on the cross. You don't have to suffer the sins of mankind. I will turn the deed to the world system over to you. All you have to do is say, I'm great. And the temptation there would be to fulfill the mission before it even started without any of the suffering or any of the pain. The incredible wrath that Jesus would have to endure to pay for our sins. And he says, no, because I am not allowed to worship anyone other than the true God. The dynamics of temptation here are real interesting. They're found in condensed form in the book of 1 John, verse, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the, the cosmos, the world. The world is passing away, also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. It's interesting. He's saying, All that is in the world... Every evil, every sin, every aspect of temptation boils down to one of three things. The lust of the flesh, food, drugs, sex outside of marriage, stuff that feels good. It's not necessarily evil in and of itself, but can be used in a way that is hostile to God. Our, our hunger, our desire for physical pleasure, the lust of the eye, which is greed, materialism, wanting what others have, just putting yourself in a place where you desire what others have and you refuse to be content for yourself, making sacrifices and taking things and wanting things and lusting after things so that you could be more comfortable or more powerful or more wealthy or whatever it is and the pride of life, wanting power, influence, and the desire to be our own God. All the evil things in the world can be fit into one of those three categories. And what is it that Satan says to Jesus? Let's get some food, let's get some worship, and let's put on a big show. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. See Eve in the garden, it's the same thing. The Bible is amazingly consistent in its description of this process that we go through. Genesis 3, 4 through 6, the serpent, Satan, shows up in the garden and says, you will not die if you eat of that fruit, for God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. I wanna be like God, the boastful pride of life knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eye, and it was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit, she ate it, and she gave also to her husband, and he ate. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life. Oh, that we could identify it that easily so that we could see it coming when it comes at us. Because it's never that obvious. Most of the time, we don't even know we're being tempted until we're chewing on the apple. Be like, wait a minute. So how do you fight temptation? What does that look like? Well, I think it starts with, we have to understand that temptation is not a sin. One of the key tactics that the Satan likes to use is when we get embroiled in a battle for what we are going to do and we feel tempted, you're on the computer, it's late at night, no one's around, check out some pornography, that thought hits your head and it's like, well, I mean, I've already thought of it. That's just as bad as doing it really. So I might as well indulge. That's not how that works. Jesus was tempted just as we are, yet without sin. The thing that we have to understand is temptation is the battlefield. It's not the battle. 
When you're feeling tempted, that's when it's time to fight. That's when it's time to realize, oh my gosh, I am considering doing something wicked. And there is still plenty of time and opportunity to use your free will to agree with God and have a glorious victory. And Satan loves nothing better than to try to convince us when we're in the throes of temptation, the battle is already over. Jesus exemplifies how untrue that is by refuting the lies of the evil one because of his knowledge of Scripture. Each time, what happens? Satan says, eat the bread. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Throw yourself off and be caught. It is written. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Worship me and I'll give you the whole world. It is written. You shall have no other gods before me. See, he is able to use the wisdom, the truth, and the clear moral principles of the Bible because he knows them. He's read them. He's studied them. And when he is faced with temptation, what he does is he searches back and says, what does God's word have to say about this? The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. So he identifies what's at the root of the motivation to complete the temptation. And then he knows the scripture that will help him understand that this is a bad idea. I can know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is not what God wants. It's an amazing object lesson. It's like two pugilists, two master fighters, punching and counterpunching and understanding the artful craft of engaging in an ideological warfare. And that's what this is, very much so. If we want to avoid temptation, we have to be on guard. You know, another great scripture is 1 Peter 5.8 says, be aware and alert because Satan prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What a great imagery that is. Outside this door is a lion roaring from hunger. Who's going to be alert now? That's how alert he says you should be. The evil one, the ruler of this world, is hungry and looking to devour you at all times. Be alert. Be on guard. Think about what's coming after you. Think about the ideas that you're being pummeled with. Think about the opportunities that are coming your way and be on guard. It doesn't mean be fearful. It doesn't mean cower in the corner. It doesn't mean hide yourself from the evil of the world. It means recognize it. It means see it coming. Have your skills honed to understand the consequences of choices and their importance and how they fit in with God's will for your life. Understand that this is a battle for the mind. And that that battle, the battle of words, the battle of ideas, the battle of logic is actually a higher cost battle than a physical one, according to the Bible. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they are divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. And every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying we're involved in a battle. We're in a war. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. And we don't use swords, and we don't use guns, and we don't use hand grenades. Because those things are not as powerful as words and thoughts and ideas. Swords and guns and hand grenades can destroy someone's body, but you can't touch someone's soul with those things. An idea can touch someone's soul. It can change eternity for them. It can change the way that they see the world. It can change the values that they have. It can change 
what they live for and what they die for, an argument is so much more powerful in the face of eternity. A hand grenade can do nothing to eternity. A well-placed word can change it. That's the dynamics of what the Bible is talking about here. This idea of spiritual warfare is very real and it's very important. And it's something that we are all caught up in the middle of. It's a fight for the hearts and minds of God's creation. And one of the things that's super important to understand about this concept of spiritual warfare are that people are not the enemy. There's no human being who is the enemy of God in this spiritual war. There are definitely people who are deceived. There are definitely people who are confused. And there are definitely people who are attacking the truth and what is good. But that's because they are deceived, not because they are not valuable, wonderful creations loved by God that should be respected and loved by us. This is not a battle against people. This is a battle against the diabolical evil of Satan and the world system. Physical weapons never change hearts, but ideas can change eternity. We'll close with this. Look at Jesus's mission. Why did Jesus come? We turn to Luke 4, 16 through 21, and we read, And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, as was his custom, and he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. So this is real early. Jesus is 30 years old. He hasn't done any ministry yet. He shows up at church on Sunday morning and stood up, and they gave him a piece of Scripture to read. It happened to be from the prophet Isaiah. It was handed to him. Jesus opens the book and he found the place where it was written and he read it aloud. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recover sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and everybody in the synagogue was looking at him. And he turns and he looks at everybody It says, that scripture that you just heard has just been fulfilled. Now, everybody who was there and had been studying the Old Testament since they were kids knew that was a messianic prophecy about the Messiah who would come to preach the gospel to the poor and to free the captives and to heal the sick. And Jesus is the only person in the history of that synagogue, I guarantee it, who got in there, read that, and said, guess what, guys? That's about me. (laughs) This is what I've come to do. I've come to open the eyes of the blind and to give people an understanding of how they've been deceived by the world system and give them a true picture and a true view of who God is. Jesus' mission is our mission. Our mission is to be reconciled to God. The first thing we have to do in this spiritual war is stop fighting for the wrong team. The wrong team believes they are their own God. And you might be like, I don't think I've ever met anyone who thinks that they're God. I know they exist, but most of them are locked up. Most people believe they are God, their own God. Anyone who has ever said, I am the master of my own destiny. I decide what's right and wrong for myself, which I have definitely said. What they're doing is they're saying, my job is to be my own God. And God's claim is, that's not what I made you for. And you can't have my job. You're wonderful. You're you're dynamic. You're made for all kinds of good things. You're created in my image. I can see why you would be confused. But there is only one God, and that's me. And I actually am the one that decides what right and wrong are. You can rebel against what's true, but you cannot decide what's true. You can pursue evidence for what's true, but your believing it's true does not make it so. Our job is to be reconciled to God. John 6, 21, Jesus says to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. 
The way that you become a Christian, the way that you come to a reconciliation and a peaceful relationship with God is you throw up your arms and you say, I am not God. I have problems. I need you in my life. I need Jesus in my life. I need you to forgive my sins and help me understand what this crazy world is all about. That's what you do. It's a faith decision where you come to the place where you recognize that you are not God and you put God on the throne of your life. Once you do that, then it's about joining Jesus and his work to help other people get the, the, the blurred vision of what they think that we're supposed to be about. People think that life is supposed to be about all these things. It's about money. It's about sex. It's about power, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. Most people in the world think that is the path to happiness. No wonder we live in such a sad place where there's so much pain and rebellion and evil and selfishness because people are deceived and devaluing the wrong things. And they shouldn't be feared and they shouldn't be judged by us. They should, we should be compassionate toward that because such were all of us at one point, living for the wrong things and making ourselves miserable. And Jesus' work is our work. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Bible can be boiled down to those two things. Love God and love your fellow man. That's what life's about. That's the great mystery. It's called the great commandment. The whole Bible and who God is and what God's will is for your life is that you love him and you love the people around you deeply and passionately and generously. And the way to do that is called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That just means go and teach everybody what I have taught you about loving God and loving each other. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Remember, what did he command them? Love God and love your fellow man. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. I will be with you as you continue the mission. Love God, love your fellow man, be reconciled to God and help others learn to love God and love their fellow man. That's what it's all about, kids. That's the whole shebang. And doing that is a life of adventure and excitement and passion and purpose and pain and frustration and failure but it's so real and it's so good and it has so much more to offer than Netflix. So much more that we can do and there are people out there that are dying literally and spiritually with no clue because the truth of who God is for them hasn't penetrated the deception of the ruler of this world. That's what I've got. Next time Jesus begins his ministry.